We have a very, very interesting international session to kick off this afternoon session. And it's about success, about early stage success. And we have a few um, experts and drivers in that scene globally who speak about it. And we hope that you engage into that discussion. I'd like to call on stage Marina Treshkova of Fastlane Ventures. Give an applause to Marina, who is one of the few women in the field. Um, we have Robert Goldberg, who is a partner and founder of Crossroad VC, just coming from the West Coast. Robert, give an applause to Robert also. Uh, we have our dear friend Lars Hinrichs uh, from Hamburg, Germany, joining. Give an applause to Lars. Who knows Lars' company, Xing? Former company. Woo! Boda is now a very happy shareholder of your previous company. And uh, you're now the founder of Hack Forward. And you made a lot of uh, news, not only, but it's, and you should speak about it later. And I'm very happy also that last moment, a uh, very renowned Russian entrepreneur and uh, investor, Sergei Belosov of Runa Capital, co founder, is joining. And uh, he's just joining now. So, and one little thing have you seen this DLD Informilio? Magazine. Who has, who has seen it? It's in your bags. Jennifer Schenker and her team did it, and we're really happy, and it's very interesting what's, what's inside. So if you have a minute, just look at it. But now the attention is to our panel. Um, in kicking off, maybe would like to ask everybody to shortly introduce himself, herself, which, which I did in a few um, words now, but also to give a short idea, um, what is your approach to to early stage investing. And uh, before we do that, however, I think Marina, you will also share some new data on the Russian market. Uh, what is the uh, scene right now? Um, how, what are latest developments? And if we get the um, charts, uh, we could do that now. Can we have Marina's presentation? <laughs> no, no, we get yeah. it. It take, takes a few moments. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, so while we have the slides on the screen, I just want to say a little bit of, you know, sh very shortly on fast lane ventures. So we actually took a very unique approach <clears throat> in Russia on the early stage uh, investment. We believe that for Russia, the best approach is what we're doing today. This is fast lane ventures and a leading developer yeah, okay, leading developer of online companies in Russia, and we took the setup of operational partner and financial partner in one, in one place, if I may say so. So we actually develop the companies, we find uh, the right entrepreneurs, the right leaders for our part, companies as uh, co-founders, so because there are actually a lot of talented people in Russia who just don't have an idea at, at the moment what to develop, and then we provide them the setup where they can join our companies and together with us build successful, strong companies in online uh, marketing, consumer, internet. So, and then we provide the seed financing at the early stage to the companies, later attracting foreign and Russian uh, VC to support the businesses and their growth. So we have over 20 companies today, over 1,000 people which are working together with us in portfolio companies and continue investment, investing in the company, so it's close to 80 million which is already invested. Uh, being, uh, taking an active part in the Russian internet, so we decided a uh, few months ago together with eVenture Capital Partners to do the study of the Russian internet and the investment scene of the Russian internet in the early stage. So, since the slides are not on, so you'll just, you know, believe me that uh, this but is the information. But we put it on in a second, so you can. <laughs> okay, get good. It, yeah. No, but so maybe you we, continue. Yeah, so we covered uh, uh, the investments done in the Russian internet in uh, in 2010 and 11. So we covered only publicly available information. So this is important to say because there are lots of deals which are not covered anywhere. So it wasn't possible to get that information. So it is to over 274 deals which we. Uh, studied and analyzed, and um, 
the total level of investment uh, done uh, in uh, these uh, businesses is uh, reached 1.3 billion US dollars in 2010, and it's almost doubled to 2.2 billion US dollars in 2011. Uh, this is uh, including, of course, the money uh, which went into the uh, I, you know, which went into IPOs of you know Yandex and Mail, which was you know happening during that period of time. Um, so the key facts are that uh, uh, seed uh, seed rounds have increased uh, dramatically over this time. So in 2000, so it's actually almost three times more seed investments which was done in 2011 compared to 2010. So we've seen only eight exits in this period of time. Uh, and um, the total foreign capital uh, is actually today is over you know, three-fourths of total deal volumes, but this is only if we counting already later rounds. So if it's seed round around A, so which is natural, so it's only 20% of these deals are covered by foreign investors. The rest is local Russian VCs which are investing in that scene. And um, the major interest for investors today, this is where we've seen the highest number of investments and exits, is two sectors. So it's, of course, e-commerce. This is the most attractive and most interesting uh, industry sector still today. Uh, and uh, it's the video segment, uh, a little bit still, you know, slowly developing the mob mobile sector, but it's already taking the seventh place in terms of number of investments. I think that's it. You know, sorry that the slides no, no, yeah, didn't uh, we, show up. We will yeah. distribute okay. them later. Good. Just on your portfolio, one uh, clarifying question. So the 20 companies, how would they, um, how would they distribute in terms of models? Is it e-commerce? Is it media? Is it platforms? Uh, it's five companies in e-commerce sector out of 20. Uh, we would love to do more, but as Oscar was saying earlier you know, in his session, this is not really about front end, it's back end. So it's a huge investment which goes into the logistics and you know, working capital needs. So we cannot really go more into those categories, although we have a huge experience in that over years. Uh, and then we have online advertising, you know, three mm -hmm. companies in that sector, and then social media. And social media would be, for instance, uh, well, the, the closest to that is, well, we consider them as a social media. This is a pin me business model, and then, uh, well, it's a social. So it's a pin interest. Uh, of Russia. Sorry. It's <laughs> okay. But it's, well, that's, no, that's <laughs> okay. quite, okay. yeah, quite right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Marina, uh, for, for introducing also the market, and you see the dynamic here and also the um, speed you build up your portfolio, so to say, in terms of. Robert, um, I hope that your charts are on, but maybe you'd like to introduce yourself yeah, also, yeah. and uh, we we get them now. No, 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 no. It's, it's good. We let uh, let us prove that we can uh, bring charts online. So <laughs> we might want. Is my microphone on? I think so. That would be a good yeah. start. Yeah. We can we can skip. We can. Uh, it'll it's be on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. And maybe introduce yourself uh, also again. Uh, yeah, you know, what you do with Crossroads. So, uh, I, uh, my name is Robert Goldberg. Um, I'm a 30-year entrepreneur uh, slash investor, and uh, I normally have about an hour-long pitch to tell you about why I'm excited about the current stage of investing. I call it good to growth, but we're gonna try and do it in 30 seconds or less, maybe. Uh, two minutes. Is, two minutes, yeah, two minutes okay. is okay. Oh, okay. Four, five. So, uh, uh, Would you like to, how, many, how much time can we have? <laughs> we'll take three minutes, okay. how about that? Um, and how can I advance these slides? Yes, I think that should work. Is this, will this do it? Yeah. Um, so, I think that uh, I'm particularly excited uh, as I sat back over the last couple of years to look at the uh, the, the investment opportunity and the, inv and the opportunity as an entrepreneur, because I think back over about 30 years, and I think every seven or eight years we look back and we say, "Wow, that was unbelievable! Nothing else could happen to top it." And as we look back, as I look back over the last three or four, I think we're in the middle of such a period. And I call it the period of hypergrowth, uh, and I think we're going to look back in five or six years from now and we're going to say, wow, that was really exciting. Uh, why didn't we realize it while we were in the middle of it? And to kind of illustrate, uh, uh, to illustrate, I think, sort of the technology uh, jumps that we have, I always like to show this picture uh, of me 30 years ago and me today and the fact that technology's evolved so fast that it makes me look younger today than I did 30 years ago. 
uh, or maybe it's I can just afford a better photographer. But, but something must get, be getting lost in the translation. Usually I get some laughs. <laughs> Uh, apologies if my Russian isn't, isn't better, but it's probably better Is than Robert my Robert looking better now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but as we look back actually over 30 years, uh, what's really happened is something that's incredible and remarkable, and that's that the business practices have actually caused companies to accelerate in their value creation. I'll show you a couple of quick slides. Uh, 100x, 100x. And as we deconstruct why that's happened, it's really ended up being four pillars uh, of value creation. One is management practices, which have evolved over these 30 years. The second is uh, product management principles. The third actually is one that's uh, kind of a recent development, which is distribution uh, and sales strategies largely driven by social growth. And finally, technology stack. Uh, so I'm going to flip through these really quickly. I've got lots and lots of data on this, but uh, if we look back over, you know, in, in the early 80s, we had uh, companies that got created after five years showed two or three hundred million uh, dollars, uh, two hundred three, two or three hundred million dollars in market cap. Those were companies that actually usually took a lot of capital. The management practices at the time actually had to be uh, had to be much more f uh, far ranging because of the capital costs and the time to deliver products. Uh, when we fast forward, actually, make sure I got to the next slide. When we fast forward to what I call the age of uh, sort of Web 1.0, uh, management practices actually started to become much more short cycle. And that was largely driven by a reduction in capital costs uh, and the ability for product management to get uh, products out much faster. And the big innovation in that time period was actually return on investment of advertising, which is driven by the internet. And we see an order of magnitude jump in actually the value creation. We see now companies getting created that are a billion dollars. But if we fast forward to the age of hypergrowth, and this is really the last several years, there are a series of companies, and it's not an accident, that have been created in five years that are multi-billion, 10 to 100 billion dollar companies. These have been driven by fast cycle businesses. Uh, management practices that actually can, cha can change and make decisions, uh, uh, strategy decisions uh, on a dime uh, and, and can do it in a matter of days instead of a matter of years. Uh, and the biggest driver has been social growth, uh, the, the ability to actually distribute your product with almost no sales and marketing dollars. So the winners in this space, again, have been, you know, extraordinary. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the stages. There's an early and a mid-stage opportunity in hypergrowth, but the really interesting thing is actually applying these techniques to later stage companies, companies that are actually maybe 10 to 15 years old. You can actually, I think, inflect these into hypergrowth. The opportunities exist uh, at the platform level, at the infrastructure level, and also uh, in the uh, vertical and B2B and B2C level. And finally, I think, uh, and again, I could talk for, this talk is usually designed for an hour, but there are really four quadrants and four pillars uh, that support companies in hypergrowth. Uh, it's an agile management process that's forward facing. It's a product management process that does short cycles. It's a marketing process that allows your customers to market for you instead of you marketing to your customers. And finally, a technology stack which uh, is agile uh, and supports rapid change in the organization. So Thank it was, you. So it was more, I'm sorry, it was more than three no, minutes. No, and maybe we have the chance in the discussion to um, explore that further. Just allow two questions. So um, first, you, you mentioned management practice as, as um, a, a factor. Could you just elaborate a few sentences what that means? What's the change here, basically, compared now social growth, distribution, and, and capital expenditure? So, uh, I flashed by my, my, you know, my background slide, but my, uh, other than investing, I'm an entrepreneur and I was part of the early uh, management team at Zynga, growing the company from about 30 to 3,000 people in a little under three years. Uh, and the company had a practice, because the industry was moving so fast, we had a practice of what I call rebalancing the company every week. So on a Monday, mm -hmm. we would actually move between five 
and 500 people onto a project that uh, we thought was the most important project for that week. Uh, you never could have done that, uh, you know, before uh, because either the markets were moving too slow or you were, uh, in fact, uh, not getting enough data to make the decisions that quickly. But now if you don't make decisions that quickly, uh, you won't survive in the marketplace. And you also apply it in a disruptive way, social media, to um, manage the company internally? So uh, at Zynga, uh, just to name one, but Facebook, I think, Pinterest, Instagram, uh, all of these companies grew with almost no marketing dollars, mm -hmm. uh, zero marketing dollars, traditional marketing dollars. What we did was we constructed a product, and I think this is all of the companies that I invest in now all have this similar, uh, you know, similar outlook, is you design a product that allows the customer to market it for you, and you design it uh, from first principles that way. And that would be also the focus of your portfolio right now, if you look at uh, it. Yes. Yes. And, and the later stage companies, could you give an example of um, a company you see that could be kind of changed and, and uh, in a way you just described? Sure. So uh, without going into specific discussions, because uh, the fund uh, that I'm involved with is stage agnostic, so we invest mm. in seed and early as well as uh, growth style investments. Most of us can recognize a company that's maybe 10 or 12 years old that doesn't use, that's actually relatively successful, has you know 20 or 25 percent growth rates, uh, you know has nice margins, but uh, has is using an older technology stack makes management decisions on a monthly basis uh, and probably doesn't use any kind of social techniques, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very long list of those uh, both in Russia and globally. And those, I think those companies are really ripe for, uh, I think, uh, uh, going what, from what I call good to growth. Interesting. So thank you. Um, Lars, um, um, now, now you're next. I think you also have a, a short introduction, but maybe um, before you show the video, um, just what are you doing right now? Um, maybe explain. You're often um, presented as the founder of Xing, which was a, com a great company you created, but you moved also on and you're active in, in many other fields right now. Maybe introduce yourself. When it comes to, to this kind of age of hypergrowth, maybe you uh, just Robert go, uh, yeah. said about, um, somewhere it has to start. And mm. I think that there is a great talent pool in, in Europe. Um, being the engineers. And I think the engineers are actually the um, artists of the 21st century. But in Europe, we don't have the tendency to, to fund those companies. Mm -hmm. And this is why I started Hack Forward, which is an investment company which only invests in engineers. And maybe we can play yeah. the video, then it's clear. Can we have it? And, and some if you're like us, you love building cool stuff, pushing what's possible, breaking new ground, imagining the future. Maybe you work a day job in Paris, but spend your nights coding a pet project. Maybe you're finishing up a PhD in London, but think your final dissertation might have legs beyond the classroom. Or maybe you've already started a little venture in Istanbul, but feel ready to take it to the next level. We'd like to invite you to Hack Forward, where Europe's most passionate developers turn their great ideas into game-changing tech startups with global impact. Why are we doing this? Well, we're all successful tech entrepreneurs ourselves, and we're building exactly the support and advice we wish we'd had back when we first started. So how do we work? You come to us through our referrer network with a clickable idea, and perhaps even the co-founder or two who helped you build it. Forget PowerPoint and pie charts. We'd rather understand why you believe the world needs it. If we agree your product shows potential, even if there's plenty yet to resolve, we'll roughly match your current salary for one year, so you can spend that time focused entirely on making it something great. And it doesn't matter where you're based in Europe. At most, you're two hours away by plane or seconds away by email. We'll make it easy for you to connect with our network of experienced tech entrepreneurs who can give input at any point along your journey as you grow and learn to manage a business. 
We also handled the administrative load, like salary payments, contracts and accounting, or even finding talent when you're ready to scale up. And once you've launched, we'll throw our full weight behind promoting your product as widely as possible. In exchange for money, creative and strategic advice and administrative help, Hack Forward gets 30% equity in your startup. You keep 70%. No small print, no surprises. If you succeed, we succeed. And we intend to do everything we can to ensure you do. We also believe in rewarding those who help you most along the way. That's why we'll give you back 3% of our share of the equity so you can use it to say thank you to whomever made the biggest impact. It could be the person who referred you in the first place, or an advisor with particularly smart advice, or even another hack forward startup who gave a crucial bit of feedback. Great input is great input, and you'll receive plenty of it along the way. Which also means that if you help others, you stand to get gifted equity in their startups too and learn from what they're doing in real time. Even if your startup doesn't take off, and there will always be some that won't, a year with Hack Forward will be one of unparalleled professional learning and growth. So, what do we stand for? Put simply, Hack Forward is about momentum, about freedom to focus on your passion, and the inspiration and input you need to make the best choices along the way. So you can get to beta sooner, Integrate feedback better, learn faster, and dream bigger. Because we love imagining the future too, and we'd like to help you build yours. Welcome to Hack Forward. So thank you. There was some commercial aspect, Lars, about this demonstration. And it explains the process. <laughs> okay. Um, just now, you had this idea, I think, three years ago, right? Uh, we started uh, in two years ago. Two years closely. ago. And could you just maybe explain how you um, built and gr grew that platform since then? So how many um, uh, developers engaged into the platform? Where, where are you at this point after the two years? So we invested now in uh, 16 companies. Um, a total workforce uh, now about like 70 people around. Um, and uh, to, to speak about uh, successes, I think um, we have now more follow-on funding secured than actually we invested in the companies. We had one company which won as first non-US company the global um, AWS challenge of Amazon uh, as the best engineering project. And uh, we was got Fantasy Shopper. Fantasy Shopper yeah. from, from England and we, we just launched uh, last week, one company which uh, got to the Mac App Store um, first place in all major markets uh, within like days. So, really early stage uh, tech startups, and especially if we look at um, the Silicon Valley, it's very often that developers are actually the CEOs of, of companies. But if you look at Europe, um, you find the MBAs. And uh, we only invest in the best engineering talent. And uh, we think even if there's a great guy with a great idea, but there is no way that he or we think that it's actually going to be uh, great va revenue, we still believe that uh, great people will come out with a great product uh, to end up some, uh, earning some money. And this is where we are going. So we are, we are at the what we call pre-seed stage, where we really started the very, very first angle, and then uh, we happy to, to give it to my left or to my right. So before we go to your left, just two questions from, Mar uh, judgments from Marina. Do you think in the Russian market that approach could work? In supporting investing in the technology? Yes, this <coughs> pre-stage tech. Well, Definitely, because this is what Sergey will probably speak about. You know, this is definitely the approach of Runa. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I believe so. There are strong, very strong yeah. engineers and technology educated people here, for sure. It's known all around the world. Uh, we, it's just for us, you know, we thought that 
the quickest way to give the value to the Russian consumers is really of creating the consumer models. So they're not very strong technology driven. There are definitely engineers inside, but that's probably you know, less to the extent to what Lars is talking about. But it's a good idea, I think, for Russia. Yeah. Robert, how would you comment? I mean, there are models like Y Combinator and others uh, in the West Coast you know well and maybe you're involved with. How do you look at that approach from your point of view? I think it's a nice contrast between what Y Combinator is doing, which I think is helpful to a very large number of startups, but I think the difference that you have is you're putting a lot more time into a, a smaller set, and uh, as we see, you know, I think in a number of ecosystems, it's important to nurture, uh, I think, to nurture the entrepreneurs and provide uh, support. So, I, you know, I, I think what Lars is doing is, is, is really... Uh, uh, Fantastic, and I think really important to, uh, to the ecosystem. Interesting. So maybe you have a, soon a new spot in your network, I saw, in the east. But now, um, Sergei, Marina already referred to you. Maybe you introduce yourself. I think for the Russian um, friends here, you are a known figure and a successful entrepreneur. For the internationals, just um, maybe introduce also your, what you did before and what is the approach of Runa Capital. Okay. Uh, so, I, I was involved in building uh, three companies uh, in technology world, parallel Zacronis, both are uh, well over 100 million, uh, and uh, also another company which is less known, but it will be over 100 million, really so, called Akumatica. Uh, all companies have engineering teams in Russia, and they sell globally, 99% of revenue is outside of Russia, all companies are technology companies, uh, probably Parallels is a very heavy technology company with a lot of... Uh, uh, unique technology, which is uh, best in its class, and so on and so forth. Other companies is more conventional. Uh, Acronis is backup, parallels is virtualization automation for service providers and uh, for desktops, and then uh, Akumatica is very boring, but uh, very cool in its own way, cloud ERP system. Uh, now I run Runa Capital. Runa Capital is a, a, a venture fund, uh, around $100 million, which invests uh, from stage averse, just the same as the crossroads. So we invest from $100,000 to a $10 million. If we need to invest m more than $10 million, we are happily co-investing with uh, a leading European or global or Russian VCs. So we have uh, participated in several uh, $40 million deals. Uh, not all of the deals are announced by now. Uh, Runa exists uh, technically for about one and a half year, but uh, um, physically, uh, you know, we started fully functioning since April last year. However, we've already made about 20 investments and we'll close another 20 investments soon. Um, we have a very specific strategy. I, I just want to talk about the strategy uh, very quickly. Uh, first, we uh, invest in minority. Uh, we only have one investment in majority in the whole portfolio. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this investment <laughs> right now, uh, but the investment knows that what I mean. And everything else uh, is minority. Actually, one thing which um, was uh, very special in the presentation of uh, Lars, which kind of sounded like an alarm for me, is like, come to us and we'll only give, take 30% of your company. I think 30% is a lot in the early stage. I think the unique thing about um, Y Combinator is that they take anywhere from 3 to 10% of the company. And would I be a good engineer? I will never give up 30% of my company uh, for some, uh, you know, strange help of some strange... Uh, uh, Okay, you know, so uh, I'm very happy for this moment of <laughs> so controversy. It's a, it's a, it's a re reverse uh, selections criteria. I think, uh, you know, at the early stage, you need to really think about uh, 10, 20 percent and not 30 percent. Uh, we also try to invest in companies where they raise a significant technology advantage, uh, whether it's either very difficult to build a technology, like one of our investments called Nginx. Uh, Nginx has, uh, I think, the founder is somewhere in the room, maybe. Nginx has a technology which is very, very hard to replicate. It's a web server which is used by all the leading internet resources such as Facebook, such as Groupon, such as LinkedIn, I believe, such as uh, you know, Pinterest, such as Instagram, and so on, and so WordPress. Uh, it, it's a number two web server. Hopefully, it will become number one web server real soon. Uh, um, or we invest in companies where it's very difficult to build technology because it takes a very long time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I cannot give you examples of our portfolio because we haven't announced them yet. But, you know, I can give example of my own portfolio. Akumatica is a cloud ERP. It's nothing really complex. You can, you know, uh, build it. But uh, in order to build it, you first have to hire uh, 20 to 30 right engineers, which have to sit and build uh, the platform and the technology for, say, five years. And so it's a long time. 
Uh, Nexin, we only invest in companies, we try to invest in companies which uh, can have a global market. So in our whole portfolio, we only have a couple companies which uh, focused on Russian market, and that's only because they focused on Russian market first. Uh, uh, majority of the companies we invest in have to be focused on global market, in which way we are very different from Fastlane. Uh, we also only invest in companies uh, which can scale their business uh, to over 100 million in less than 10 years. Uh, so it's revenue, very important revenue? to uh, revenue. 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 Revenue, yeah, revenue. Uh, more than 100 million dollars uh, in less than 10 years. It, it's, it's not so much if you go to a leading Silicon Valley funds, you will get to be, uh, to hear that they will only invest in companies which can scale their revenue to over a billion uh, in less than 10 years. We are not uh, quite as cool as this guy, so we, we will be fine with 100 million. Frankly speaking, a billion in 10 years is really difficult. 100 million is quite doable. Uh, and we try to invest in companies where we can help. That means either with our expertise, we have a very specific expertise in our fund. A lot of our LPs are guys who build uh, cloud services companies for small business. Uh, we probably, our LPs have uh, several billion dollars in revenues of cloud services to small business. Serve basically almost every small business in the world something. Uh, it's companies like GoDaddy, Endurance, One and One, uh, and so on and so forth. So we can specifically help in companies who are doing something in cloud services. Uh, but also, uh, we try to invest in companies where we have a connection with the management uh, team. So we, be, we will uh, see that we can help and they will accept our help. In a lot of cases, it's difficult. Even with very good team, you may have a, a very stubborn entrepreneurs who will never really listen to you at all, especially since we're a minority investor and not like a majority investor like Fastlane, we have to beg for them to, uh, beg them to, to accept our help and so they have to be ready to listen. Uh, yeah, and, and that would be... Thank you for, for, for this introduction also. Uh, thank you for bringing some controversy to um, this panel. There are two lines of controversy maybe we could discuss, but first I like Lars, you know, um, to give Lars a chance to um, respond to your uh, point about you know value you bring in early stage to put it a little bit more in a qualitative. It's um, not about value; it's about thirty percent. Okay, <laughs> I like this, <laughs> but Lars, now you up to you to discuss why you think you're worth thirty percent. Sure, absolutely, and uh, let me answer this question by the feedback we get. So those people who say like this is a lot, they are mostly business guys. Maybe you are a good, good exception for this. But the engineers we, we get in our program say it's actually a fair deal. And this is what in the end counts. And the, the value what we bring, uh, everybody of you can see it today still uh, or already. If you go to passionmeetsmomentum.com, um, we, we do uh, quarterly conferences where we bring the top of the, the best uh, big time entrepreneurs, investors, and um, technology experts uh, to the table and we have an in-depth relationships we're building between us as a company, our referral network and the companies and this is advice and feedback uh, which is close to priceless. So what we are targeting are the first-time entrepreneurs who are people who are just getting out of college and starting their first technology company. For a serial entrepreneur we are not the right choice and they maybe should go directly to Runa, Fastlane or Crosswords. But for those engineers who, who are afraid of the eager terms of the VCs, um, they come to us and they like what, what we see. In the next round, we're diluted to 20%. The, and our goal is still that um, the entrepreneur and the founding team has more than 50% after the next round of funding. And also, you organize the very early stage, the, er, the pre-seed stage. If you look typically, uh, people come to deals, us, you know, uh, with a clickable demo yeah. about, about what is possible, yeah. and then we say within 72 hours, yes or no. Um, they are not ready. Our companies are not ready for VC. Robert, I'd like to ask you maybe first to comment on these two two approaches, and maybe also to describe what you think is the key value you bring to the entrepreneur. Because you, you, what you, in your presentation you showed, you have a very clear point of view which type of company will be successful and why. Um, so, so how would you, if you, if you reflect on that, what is the value you think 
personally with your approach, but maybe if you speak also as a, um, a role model in, in, in the Silicon Valley, what, how do you see that? And Marina, I would like to comment, have you comment also later. Um, so the first part was, I think, I think what you see are two different approaches, uh, and I, I, I don't think I could, would criticize either. I think uh, there are multiple ways to create value for entrepreneurs and for your investors, uh, and I think we've, we've heard of a, a number of them. I, I understand what Lars is doing is actually, I, again, is uh, promoting the, uh, I think, uh, very early entrepreneurs uh, and helping them sort of get, get, you know, get to the next level. And there are multiple ways, you know, I think there are multiple ways to do that. Um, my preference uh, is to actually invest slightly later in, uh, in teams that, you know, actually, I think, uh, have some experience and have some product. Um, uh, we, do, we do in a stage ag agnostic way, uh, and we have a set of uh, not just investors, but all of us are experienced entrepreneurs. So we tend to be uh, very hands-on, and as a result, the portfolio is generally pretty focused. It's, it's you know, measured in, you know, in a few handfuls rather than, you know, in, in some cases people have, you know, dozens and dozens in their portfolio because we spend a lot of, a lot of time. And I think our, you know, our real value, uh, you know, tends to be actually, uh, you know, that we're shoulder to shoulder as, as fellow entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, helping you b build the business, but coming from uh, you know very successful and recently successful backgrounds in building some of the biggest you know sort of the biggest companies out there. Marina, you have also a, a very clear model. You said majority, mm -hmm. and you look basically also for the person who would be able to mm -hmm. implement or execute a model. Is it right? Um, you know, I think that Russia, you know, and we've, we've heard a lot about it today, is a great land of opportunities, it's a huge market, but it's extremely difficult market to execute. So it requires really excellence in execution in order to, on a very clear horizon of, I don't know, five years, you know, not 10 years, but five years to build a company with, you know, value of more than 100 million, you know, this is the target that we have. For this, you know, we created the Fastlane Ventures, which is actually a strong structure of over 50 people of experts, you know, who are physically running together with the CEOs who we find or who come to us to run the companies to help them execute with these first six, nine months of operations. For that, yes, we take the, we are majority shareholder. We are not going usually after that in the round, so we help companies to attract the right investors, but we believe that our value is really for, I mean, every, every share in the company, we provide that value, so we have, uh, experts in all different areas which are physically on a day-to-day -day basis working with the CEOs. You know, we create a lot of training inside the companies, so because we have 20 companies, a lot of expertise, so we provide it immediately to the companies and allow them to grow quickly. We've created just recently a, a big back office center outside of Russia, outside of Moscow, sorry, where we take young people, invest in their education, and help to bring young talent to the companies, portfolio companies. So uh, we think that in order to be uh, fast and you know, take the opportunity today and execute well, the setup of uh, Fastlane Ventures is the most right approach in Russia. And again, I think you know, we've had a lot of discussions with Sergey before, but he looks on the global scene, you know, and I think it's very different because we only concentrate on Russia. We believe that such operational approach is the right one. Okay. I see time is already uh, almost I would like to open the floor and to have two, maybe three questions, if they are quick questions. Who has a question to the panel, to the audience? We, maybe you would like to it, uh, tell who you are and ask, could we have a mic? Maybe tell who you are and your question. And make it a question. Maybe we get two, three questions together. My name is Burton Lee. I'm with the Stanford University School of Engineering. Uh, Facebook IPO, other IPOs in the U.S. Silicon Valley, typically between 10 and 30 percent of employees own equity, which means that hundreds, if not thousands, of new millionaires are created, which has big ecosystem impacts in terms of numbers of new companies. Question, uh, typically in most European startups, the percentage of equity that employees own, I don't mean founders, I mean employees, the first 20, 100, 200, 500 people, is, in, is below 5%. It's very, very small, which has major ecosystem impacts in terms, because you don't get hundreds of new millionaires created. What typical 
shareholding percentages do you as investors look for for employees and why aren't you giving more to employees? Uh, can I answer the question? Yeah, thank you for this question. Yes, yeah, and I everybody think, can tell a uh, number. One of the basically. very special things about Americans, they believe uh, that uh, there is a difference between American startup, European startup, Chinese startup, and Russian startup. Reality is that technology startups, they are global. Majority of them are global. Even in case they are in Russia, they still compete globally. So frankly speaking, I don't see that much difference today in what employees get in our startups in Russia or uh, uh, what employees get in the startups in US. Because again, those startups compete globally. They end up competing globally for the talent as well. They end up competing globally for sales and marketing people, for engineering people, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't exactly know the statistics about m today European startups. The startups I'm involved with, they are pretty similar to American startups. Uh, 10 to 20 percent is, uh, ends up in employee hands uh, quite normally. In, in my companies, because they are older, uh, you know, it's even 25 percent. Lars, could you comment? Uh, it's between uh, 5 and 15 percent. So lower. Marina? Well, it's the same. At the setup stage, is 25 percent to the management team, but it will be dilution, you know, so I would say it end up in the range, you know, within 10 percent, no more. How important is it, Robert? Uh, we think it's very important. Yeah, yeah. This is on. Uh, and I invest actually in Israel, and uh, we in Israel. I think there had been uh, uh, a trend uh, towards you know large and larger employee pools, and you know all of our Israeli investments have large employee pools. One last question. Sorry, we're um, also in charge of timing. So, um, tell who you are, and one quick question, please. Hello everybody, my name is Konstantin. I am, I've been living in San Francisco, but I originally am Russian, I'm from Ekaterinburg. Uh, we've been developing the event networking platform, it's a website, it's, it's web-based and mobile-based uh, solution to help event organizers to organize the events. It's a commercial, yes. not a question. Of course. <laughs> and now we are on the stage when our product is almost uh, done, and we are looking for the proper idea to make our minimum viable product. It's we are on the boundary of uh, to products to be launched. So my question is, what stage am I? And what, which company presented here is much better for our case? What do you think? Uh, I, I think that I am not seed stage because I was funded myself. Okay. But uh, uh, what's next stage? You're, you're, you are yeah, probably think. still seed stage because you haven't launched a product yet. I think to, to be post-seed, you would have to have launched a product and have at least some early results. And the second question I have is, why haven't you launched yet? Yeah. Faster. You have to launch faster. Yes, I have. Would now like I, I realize that I have to speed up my development process, so I decided to find the partner, financial partner. La launch tomorrow. Yeah, okay. we, la we launched the companies but in 50 days. Yeah, first all, one, all one per month. All of the stages is uh, all very... Uh, you know, it's not very precisely defined. Uh, for example, I know one VC, I, I don't know if I can disclose this information, which invested in one of the coolest startups uh, in the world right now at, at uh, um, eight guys, no product, just a plan, $40 million pre-money, $10 million investment. Experience, uh, experience. And uh, yeah. by now, uh, it's over a billion dollar valuation in less than one year. So, I mean, seed stage or not? I mean, can you call it a seed stage? I, I'm not sure. Well, they, uh, $40 they, million they, they dollar were, money. They were experienced. They were serial entrepreneurs already. Uh, not necessarily. It was a very good idea. <laughs> and it was a very good VC. Okay. Um, but, Konstantin, thank you for sharing that, you know, and standing up and asking. So, um, you, you get the immediate feedback, and that's a very educated feedback um, at the point. I'm very sorry, time is up. I, I, I think that was really interesting also to understand your different point of views. I uh, hope you have the chance to talk to all of the four later in one of the breaks. Um, and uh, I wish we could go longer, but maybe at the next opportunity. Thank you for being here. Give an applause to our, our group.